the companies that are not brutally honest with themselves as to where they're falling short, where they have problems, they are like ostriches. They're going to put their head in the sand and they're going to let the business underperform. Welcome to the Financial Innovations Podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Bellani. We're helping CFOs save money and time by investing in cutting edge technology. Uh, be sure to like and subscribe to our show for you know uh, notifications on all of our great guests when they come on. Uh, I have the pleasure here to introduce Peter Bennett. Uh, Peter, nice to have you on the show. Nice to be here, Daniel. Thank you. So we have uh, a bunch of exciting topics to talk through uh, on the agenda over here. The first just being the evolution of the finance role. And, uh, you know, we'd love to hear from you, Peter, just in terms of, you know, your thoughts on, you know, how, where the role started, how it's evolved, uh, you know, where, where it kind of is now. Yeah, well, Daniel, thank you. I've actually been around for a long time. Um, don't have as many gray hairs as, um, as maybe I should, but I suppose that's a clean conscience, which... Hopefully, as a CFO, I'm supposed to have. But um, if we think about the evolution of the financial role, I mean, in the old days, we were bookkeepers and clerks, you know, or as the British would say, clerks. And uh, and and then we evolved from being book- bookkeepers to being scorekeepers. We would track the results and we would show the results from a month ago. And by the time we published it, it was kind of stale anyway. And then we started to become analysts and part of the role was critical for us to do analysis and start to actually have some value added beyond just keeping score. Um, And then we had to forecast the future and start to be more predictive. And then the expectation was that we were strategic business partners and thought leaders. And so today we, we can't do that. We can't be a strategic business partner if we don't keep up with technology. Um, I, I think as a CFO, if I do not stay current on technology, I can become obsolete. And it'll take me three, four, five times longer than my competitor or other CFOs just to get something done or just to process through emails. If I'm not looking at um, the AI options that you can have, um, co-pilot, et cetera, um, and using those tools. So I have to learn them. And if I don't, I'm going to fall behind and I'll be obsolete. So I think that's an interesting piece for us to recognize. Um, some of the things that also have changed. In the old days, you would have, uh, be, I'd be responsible for internal controls. I needed to make sure we had segregation of duties and two signatures and so forth. And you know what? I still have to do that. But if we are not on top of cyber threats, in all of the different ways, we actually have a bot that we believe is from China that is coming after us and is constantly trying to hit our system to be able to break in. And it's got an AI interface that is driving this engine, and it's cheap. It costs the, it costs the bad guys nothing to be constantly attacking us, and all they have to do is break through once. And it's incredibly expensive and incredibly dangerous. And so we need in finance to be very, very um, savvy of technology, of the threats. And we also have to have a vision into the future of what that technology can do for us and how we want to incorporate it into what we do and what we're going to do. Great. And, and you brought up a lot of great points that, you know, we'll kind of touch on each of those uh, items there. But, you know, it, it's funny because, you know, I, I've been you know doing the podcast for, for about a year now and met with a bunch of CFOs, VPs of finance. And, you know, one thing that that kind of resonated with me is, um, you know, I've been doing consulting for 15 years now. And, you know, if, if I re- rewind the clock five years and, ha- and think about conversations I've had with CFOs and VPs of finance. You know, if I started throwing terms out there like, you know, data warehouses and data lakes and all that kind of stuff, they'd say, hey, this is way too technical for me. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. Right. And we had a guest on the show a couple months back that 
oh yeah, I'm designing our data lake and, and our data warehouse. And, all, and I'm like, wow, it, it, it's funny to see kind of where finance has evolved even just over the past couple of years to, you know, many of the terms that, you know, someone would throw out and you'd say, that's, you know, ask IT that question. You know, now a lot more CFOs are fielding those types of questions and involved in, you know, the design of, of those kinds of databases. And, you know, it seems like, um, you know, it's just kind of parabolically, uh, you know, changed in terms of the skill set of, you know, the CFO five years ago versus the CFO today. Well, I think one of the things that technology has done is it's accelerating the pace and it is changing at a speed that society can't even keep up with, let alone old CFOs, right? Um, but we have to we have to do our best. And there was, um, you know, there's a, 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 a hockey expression that Wayne Gretzky used to use of, of skating to, he used to say, I'm skating not to where the puck is, but where the puck is going to. And we as CFOs must skate to where the puck is going to. So that also starts out with a vision. And Bay, Bay State Milling, which is um, the company that I work for, uh, we've got a strategy. It's a very robust strategy. And that strategy cannot work if we do not enable it with the right technology. So we need as much a um, technology strategy and a technology vision that's going to complement the strategy and vision that we have for the business, or it doesn't work. You can no longer say, eh, we're not a tech company. You can't do that anymore. We're, we are a flour miller and food ingredient company. We are one of the oldest industries you can find. People have been milling flour, uh, you know, wheat into flour and making bread for thousands of years. But we have to look into the future to be effective and to be able to be successful and to compete. You know, one of the other things that you uh, you mentioned just in terms of controls, and you know, I think it's something that gets often overlooked, especially in you know the age of technology and the twenty first century, you know, architecture and all that, where you know, oh, we built automation to move our data from point A to point B. And I think one thing that, you know, often gets overlooked is, you know, we put too much of a reliance in some areas on technology of, you know, the process pushed the data over. And so there's not necessarily a control in place, uh, you know, to make sure that, hey, did the technology do what, you know, what it needed to do. So I guess as you're looking at things like, you know, maintaining the, the controls and having those control points, you know, are you looking at, you know, uh, Hey, there might be this might be an automated control versus uh, you know something that a human's looking at, and like what's the Im the importance that you still place on you know human controls despite you know all this you know AI versus automation versus you know all of that. So I think it's probably more complex than I really fully understand, but but I think there are a few things that are. Um, that we're facing. I was at a CFO conference about, a, about three or four weeks ago. And one of the topics that came up with it was AI and how we wanted to use it in the function. And so if I take a step back, um, I have a lot of um, members of the team. They have to be strong. They also have to stay current with technology. So we need to train them. But I think what we can do today is we can scale the business much more easily without layering in a lot more people by using technology, by using um, automations, bots, or, um, or AI. Now, I, in the conference, one of the conversations was, the e, problem with AI is it's got a lot of learning to do. And it may be a little premature and a little early in its stage for us to really start to, to use it in, in all of its potential. Because if it learns it wrong the first time and you don't put a human control in to make sure that it is doing it right, it'll do it wrong every time. And it's going to keep kicking out the wrong outcome, the wrong result, the wrong customer service, customer support, all of that. Um, 
And so we, we need to take the technology, understand where it is in its life cycle, and make sure we're balancing it with the right human controls at the same time. That makes sense to you. Yeah, no, that that's perfect because, you know, I think right now a lot of people are looking at the, how do I get a robot to replace this person's job or that person's function? And I think we're a little bit ahead of where, you know, where the technology is right now in terms of, you know, replaceability versus sure, there are some things that could, you know, probably be replaced, but I think we're, you know, looking too heavily at what can we replace and get rid of and all that by putting a robot in there versus, you know, is the technology even ready for something like this where, you know, it's not AI right now is an assist more of an assistant than it is of a replacement to, you know, somebody's job or, you know, fun your full functions within organizations. And I think the ones that, you know, are um, struggling a lot are the ones that are, you know, just trying to jump over that hop of assist the team and, you know, get to the let's replace the team. So there's a lot in what you just said, and and I'd like to kind of respond in 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 a few different points. Um, so if we again, if we go back 40 years, it really was common for companies to have lifelong employees. Um, we gave them pensions, retirement, health care, and other rewards for longevity. But today we don't do that, right? We have a 401k that we can take with us from company to company. And I have to tell you, the younger generation, they also watch their parents get laid off um, with no loyalty from the company from their own point of view. And so it really impacts their willingness to be loyal and stay. And so we need to give them the opportunity to grow within the company. Um, they need to feel appreciated. They need to feel like they're making a difference and they need to have reasons to, to stay. But we seem to have a labor shortage here anyway in the United States. And so for our business to grow, we want to have the automation that does the, the, the work that the people don't enjoy doing and don't want to do it, that repetitive stuff. And that can make their experience more robust. Um, and so what, what I'm looking to do is take the best care of the employees that we do have um, and avoid hiring and firing based on how the business does and in its own cycles um, when the economy turns down and use technology to help me scale more easily and then build that into our culture. So that's kind of one of the frameworks that, that comes with it. The other thing that I think based on what you just said is important to understand. And, you know, I don't, I don't think we are you know, going into some of the your futuristic views of, of uh, we, we see in Hollywood Terminator where the machines are going to replace us or, um, again, uh, the Matrix, et cetera, um, where the machines are going to kick us out and, and, and take, us, take us over. However, um, they can do a lot of things and, and, and we don't even know the potential of what they can do. On the other hand, what I don't think they can do is I don't think AI can lead. Now, one of the challenges as we move forward and then replace some of that lower level work that is repetitive is um, now the younger people as they come up, how are they going to develop the knowledge and the judgment that my generation did to then be able to use it to lead if we don't get involved in a lot of the work that we had to do in order to build the judgment. And we're going to have to find other ways to develop those skills in people. If we again go back a whole, uh, uh, many, many, many years, um, we stopped using certain muscles, they atrophy. Started out with a calculator, people who used to do a lot of math in their head. And they can't do it anymore because we rely on the calculator and and um, our GPS. Um, I my son has lived in the same place for probably two years now. I'm not sure if I could find my way to his to his apartment without the GPS because I use it all the time and I just then don't think I don't use my sense of direction. We stopped reading maps, and if we move over 
and say, okay, AI, you do all of this repetitive work for us and you um, save us all of this labor, which is great. We need to make sure we're still building the muscles so that the humans can still be um, doing what we need them to do with leadership, with judgment, and with experience. Yeah, that it, it's funny that you uh, you jumped to that point. That was going to be something that I was going to talk about as well. Is you know, like even just in my own career, you know. So I've been implementing financial systems for you know fifteen plus years now, and you know how I started out. My first project when I had no experience implementing financial systems was writing the test scripts for you know uh, an implementation. And all right, here's what we're going to test and doing all those pieces. And I hated doing, it was like, you know, the, the, one of the worst, uh, you know, tasks you could, you could put someone on, uh, at least in my, my opinion, but, um, you know, but going through that, you learn, well, here are the things to look for here, you know, here are the key maintenance points of the application. Here's how to fix things that, you know, might be broken. And then you say, all right, well now an AI can go and write all that. You could say, here's my application, go in and figure out what my tests are. You know, same thing with, you know, I was proofreading design documents for, for things and, you know, and it was, you know, horrible looking for typos and stuff in, in technical documentation. But like by reading the documentation, you started to understand, you know, here's how these systems work. And now, you know, you've got all, you know, all sorts of software out there that's going to do all your, you know, it's not just spell check anymore. It's they're checking your grammar uh, probably to, you know, better than, uh, an English major or PhD, uh, you know, at this point. And you say, right, well, a lot of those key activities while they were boring, while they were mundane, while they were things that, you know, a company may not have wanted to pay for or should have paid for this or that, you know, they were key in developing, you know, understanding of the technology to the point where then I could start implementing it because I understood how it worked. And, it becomes a, how do we ensure that, you know, that, that the people can still get to that point to, to hop B without going through hop A because the AI is taking care of that, you know, that particular piece. So no doubt. And, and, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, we've got muscles and muscles in the way we think muscles in the way we, we process and and develop judgment and make business decisions um we have muscles that we use all the all all in our minds all the time whether it's math whether it's um writing skills will we stop will we stop knowing how to take an idea ourselves and turn it into sentences if we're using chat gpt or um you know or other ai like um tools to do it um Will we lose some creativity? And then what will we replace it with? But again, if we go back, again, 40, 50 years before everyone carried around a calculator, yeah, we're not using doing all of the math that we used to, but we've developed a lot of other skills along the way because we haven't had to do that math. And then we've learned to do things um, and do analysis and do uh, things beyond where we didn't have to spend as much time on just adding up the numbers and and so forth. And I think that's what's going to happen as we move forward with the technology. We're we're creative. The human mind is amazing, and we will be able to do many more things because we hadn't been able to do them today. Because our focus had to be on doing a lot more of the mundane, repetitive work that can be replaced with automations. Great. So if you're, you know, somebody in college right now studying finance and, you know, aspirations of becoming a financial analyst in a few years, like what, what are some of the things that you think, you know, somebody should be skilling up on, you know, now to be ready for, you know, when they enter, you know, they enter that, that world of finance. So again, you, you use the term financial analyst. I think it depends if you are a financial analyst who is going to be um, studying stocks. It's a different skill than a financial analyst if you're going to be an operating company. And I personally don't have enough um, of the um, experience on the stock side because I've been an operating CFO for my entire career. Um, I think you need, you need curiosity. 
you need to be able to build models. So you have to still be strong to be able to to model the process numbers to to understand. Um, I'm still a big fan that you need to understand how accounting works. Because if you are in an operating company, you have to understand how things are costed, how much they cost, how you build that properly. You still have to make sure that the company is pricing correctly. The company understands its its profit margins. Um, and you need to be able to read financial statements. And that comes with practice. But if you are a student, um, accounting is not the most fun class uh, you're going to take. Uh, but pay attention because it is important and it's a skill that you will use your your entire life. I happen to be in an industry that's unique um, in that we are very commodity based. Um, I'm in food and agriculture. We we buy wheat. Wheat is a traded commodity. And if you took economics 101 in college, uh, you learned about supply and demand. And if you don't understand how supply and demand works, you really can't work in a commodity-based business because it is absolutely the basic of basics. Um, what are the other things, though, that I liked about economics is it taught you how to think. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of problem solving. And no matter what we do um, with our careers, our ability to problem solve, especially when there's no known formula. It's something new. It's a new problem. We haven't seen it before. Exercise those muscles. Think about how you can approach issues and figure them out and resolve the issues and make things better. That is a skill that will serve you for your entire life. I would say one more that I would say, which I, I, I always give this advice to young people. The single most valuable skill you can learn as an adult or you can apply as an adult is resiliency. Because whether you're an individual, whether you're a business, whether you are a group, you're going to have good times and bad times. And your ability to bounce back from the downturns, from the problems, from the crises, and come out on top is an incredible skill. And so when things in your business or things in your life get bad, don't get too down, recognize that you're going to be able to apply and develop this new muscle called resiliency and that things are down now, but they'll get better and they'll get better as long as you work towards it and you accept that you're going to be resilient. You're going to take on the challenge. You're going to face it on and you're going to drive to make it better. Yeah, the key thing that I took away from that was, you know, there there wasn't a lot that was, you know, focused on this particular subject or that. It's it's the what may not necessarily be taught, you know, in a in a classroom setting, and you know, just building the skills to make sure that, you know, you are staying on the cutting edge. You are always learning. You are, um, you do have that resiliency to, you know, stick with whatever it is that you know you're going to to be doing. Um, you know, at, at, at that point and in the future and, you know, just, just keeping, uh, keeping it up and going with it. The more skills we develop and the more we're able to use our minds to problem solve, the better we'll be able to compete with the robots in the future too. <laughs> right. Right. Um, so I'd imagine, you know, um, cause you know, we, we have a lot of people tuning into the show that, you know, they're CFOs. We have a lot of great advice for them. We have people on that are, you know, VPs of finance that are looking to kind of get to that next level. You know, it, it sounds like based on, you know, many of the things that you said, you'd have probably similar advice for somebody kind of at that VP stage looking to get to CFO in terms of, you know, continuing to learn, continuing to um, build the problem solving muscle. Um, you know, are, are there any other things that you think like, you know, are, are key that, you know, maybe don't often get um, verbalized or, or or seen that that's important to get to that that CFO level? So I think one of the pieces that's really, really important, and again, if we kind of go back to that evolution of the function from, you know, scorekeepers um, to, to, to driving and adding value is the, the, 
the really best finance people, one, have a very high curiosity. Two, they look to understand the business that they're in. What drives it? Make sure you are not just looking at your responsibilities, but what makes the business tick? How do sales work? How do the operations work? What makes the business profitable? What can make it more profitable? And then how can we in finance have an impact? Let's not be scorekeepers. Let's impact the score. And how do we do it? We do it with the way we understand the business. And we have this unique benefit of being the first to see the numbers and the results as they come through. Now we can interpret it. We can either just throw out the numbers and say, here what they are, or we can use that knowledge and we can use our observation and we can think about what we see in the numbers, what it means and what we may do about it. And to be a really effective CFO, you need to be able to go beyond just reporting, but also interpreting and advising. And when you have that mindset, then you can be very, very impactful and add value to the business. And as long as you're adding value to the business, you will be growing within the business. Great. That's great advice. How do you, um, you know, I know you mentioned you went to CFO conference, learned, you know, a bit about, you know, AI current you know, how it's currently doing in the market or like, like what are things that you recommend, um, to, you know, kind of keep up to date on latest trends and, you know, learning and, and, and all of that. So it's hard. Um, read, listen. The other piece is, I, I think it's not uncommon for financial people, especially in operating businesses to be too internally focused. Um, Get out there. Make sure you're part of um, groups. Go to events. Listen to other people. Get exposed to different ideas. Have the opportunity to hear and learn from others and to give them your own views and then have a healthy debate. You always walk out of that having learned something and being a little better and a little smarter for having done that. A lot of finance people, we're introverts, right? Um, we, we're comfortable in the numbers. We're comfortable in the detail. Um, but the bigger picture really is important and being able to get the bigger picture, to look for it, to get out of our detail and be able to look on the, on the higher level is incredibly valuable. And then also what are other people saying, whether it's in the economy, whether it's in the industry, um, whether it's with technology. And um, we're invited to different things, to different events, uh, to different, uh, whether it's a webinar or whether it's an in-person event, go, get out of your chair. Um, whether, whether, whether you're just doing the basics or you have an opportunity to go and learn about technology or you have a, a, an opportunity to learn uh, from the experts of what's going to happen with interest rates. They're always wrong, but we can learn a lot from listening to how they're coming to their conclusions. It helps us think about it ourselves. Great. No, that's great. You know, I know, um, you know, to your point about talking, getting different perspectives on things, um, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of people out there go, they just rely on you know, things that they've either Googled or, you know, a software vendor comes and calls them up and, and says, you need this, you know, you, you need dashboards because dashboards are the, the hot buzzword, right? And and they're implementing dashboards for the sake of having dashboards versus, you know, when they actually need it. You know, how, how do you like filter out the, the noise of the, you know, just following the trends and the buzzwords and, you know, implementing what it is you actually need in the organization? To Daniel, it's a great statement. It's a great question. When we look at dashboards, metrics, um, I can go back a number of years when metrics started to become popular and I was in one company, I won't name names, but we, we went from having no metrics to a hundred and no one could really interpret what they all meant. And because you diversified it so much and diluted it, what people would talk to was, I'm going to focus this month on the metric that makes us look the best rather than, 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 than the honest metrics 
that are really telling us where we're doing well and where we really need to work and drive continuous improvement. Understanding what is the pulse of your business. What are the critical measures that you need and that if you're tracking them the right way, that you will run the business better. That's how you understand how to build your dashboard. Not And definitely not just what makes you look good. You have to look at the same things consistently, month in and month out, and you need to be brutally honest. Because the companies that are not brutally honest with themselves as to where they're falling short, where they have problems, they are like ostriches. They're going to put their head in the sand and they're going to let the business underperform. But those that say, I'm not worried that it's going the wrong way. I'm only worried if I don't understand why. And once I understand why, then I'm going to do something about it. As far as the vendors calling us, it's a, another great statement, Daniel. I, I get three calls a week for AI's solutions that are going to save me millions. Every week, two, three, four new calls, companies I've never heard of who have an AI is the buzzword, right? So it's always going to be, I've got the AI solution. It's going to be, the, and I got to tell you, I have no idea how to filter. And so I recognize that we took a step back and we've hired a consulting firm that's very well known. Um, I don't have the ability to benchmark, assess, um, know what's the right firm to buy from. And we're going to use them to be our filter. So we've signed them up. We've gotten, um, at first, they're going to build for us this strategic vision for technology for us as a first step. And then we're going to have them on retainer. And we're going to leverage the research that they can do in order to make sure that when we are making the selection, in order to achieve that vision, that we're filtering it with the right level of expertise. Because you can't keep it in out. You can't keep up. It's just impossible. Yeah. And another key takeaway, just don't don't buy the, the BI dashboard uh, vendor that has the best colors. Because uh, it's not about the colors. It's about the information that's on uh on the dashboard and making sure that you're assessing based on the right the right metrics there to your point. But a vendor can't tell you what needs to be on the dashboard. They can sell you this pretty graph and pretty picture and show you. And by the way, the demo always looks so much better than uh, when, when, when you go into reality and have to deal with it. But you still have to do the thinking and the selection. And I happen to be working on dashboards um, it's one of the projects that we are working with. Um, it's not automated, um, but that's the right way to do it. First, you've got to get it right, then you automate it. You have to make sure you're looking at the right things and you've chosen the right items before then you move into trying to get an AI or an automation that's going to spit it out for you efficiently and, and pretty as well. Right. And, and and I think that's probably one of the biggest mistakes a lot of companies make is that they try to just package everything together of the like, build out these automated dashboards that feed data from over here, look great, have, you know, all these metrics. And then they go in, they spend, you know, a million dollars or whatever building this thing out. And then they realize that, oh, wait, we need a different set Oops. of metrics. Right. <laughs> and uh, and it's back to the drawing board versus the, you know, to your point of, it doesn't have to be automated from day one. Get it right. And once it's right, then automate it where you know that, you know, the money that you spend going and, you know, bringing all your data across, setting it up nice so that it can be in those nice colorful charts and graphs and, you know, and all that, that, you know, it's it's what you actually need instead of, you know, that's draft one is, you know, and you spent a million dollars on that. <laughs> Daniel, again, a million dollars, you can blow it and have to start over again so easily. It is so easy to throw that money away by not doing it right. There's an old sort of carpenter's um, me um, con concept, measure twice, cut once. So before you go spend that million dollars, validate what you really want from it 
make sure you're taking it into the right direction and you're achieving what it is that you set out to do because otherwise you spent the money and it's not like it's not like the video game you can't get the undo or get uh what is it you know get health you know go over the bump the, 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 to, to get health or a new life or whatever a million dollars is gone it ain't coming back so yeah no that that you know that that's exactly it and um you know, I, I, I worked with, uh, I worked with a company in the past that, you know, they just kept changing their mind on like what they actually wanted. And, you know, we, you know, we obviously provided our, our advice and they said, no, this is what we want to do. And then we go and say, all right, you know, we don't advise it, but we'll build it. And they, you know, we built it and they said, nope, we want to change direction. And I mean, they changed direction. It, it's not even a dollar amount loss too. It's also the time that you lose in the process as well, where, they spent two years like going back to the drawing board like three or four times and and starting over and building everything out. And then it's, oh, wait, we can't use this. So uh, project canceled. And, you know, now you look at all that money that was spent, right? And and they weren't better off afterwards than, than during there. So, you know, it's a matter of, you know, making sure that like, hey, how do we, um, how do we make sure that we're actually proving the concept that we're getting it everything right that we need. And then we go and build, you know, our system around it to, you know, to, to capture all that. Yeah. Again, Daniel, absolutely right. It's both the time you've lost two years. You, you just wasted and churned and whatever money that you, you spent, you're not getting back. But there are a lot of failed ERP implementations. Um, and these, these, Putting in an AI isn't necessarily as big or complex as in the ERP because you don't have to make it all encompassing. We are um, working with a firm here in the Boston area that is doing some automation for us. So I'm not sure if we're allowed to use the term bots. It used to be popular and now we're supposed to call everything AI, I think. But you know, it started out with the idea that they would they would put in a bot. I've got a very manual process in my billing group, right? And I think we can we can put it in automation, and by doing that, we can really um, start to scale the business much more easily without adding a lot of people and training them up on the system, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is our first project. It's a proof of concept. If that bot does what I hope it does and provides the return on, on the investment that I expect it to, well, then we're going to start taking, we're going to take a step back and say, well, where are the other processes? Not just in finance, but in operations and supply chain management, et cetera. We then can apply the technology. But I'm a big believer. You crawl before you walk, you walk before you run. And, and then you don't end up spinning your wheels, wasting two years of work and a million dollars thrown out the door because you tried to get too fast to somewhere that you weren't actually even sure where you were going. And, and I think that kind of um, begs the question of, you know, like I, I see two kind of different schools of thought when it comes to doing a, a technology implementation. There's the there's the one side that's let's go take a very simple process and go build a small utility that we see if we can automate this. And then, you know, if we can prove it out on a small scale, we'll take it to a, a bigger problem. Then there's the other side that's, well, you know, I don't really care about something that's going to save me a thousand dollars a year. Um, so why don't we do a proof of concept on a big problem and, uh, you know, something that's going to save our company $10 million. And if it works there, then we're going to apply that, you know, to, uh, to other places. And obviously, you know, there are pros and cons of each approach, uh, you know, starting small, you might, you know, you're not investing a lot into it if it, if it doesn't, you know, go your way. Um, but you know, the return on it obviously is, uh, is much smaller than, you know, taking a big problem. I guess, what would you recommend for, for companies like that, that are trying to say, you know what, we're hearing a lot about AI automation or just automation in general. We want to look at those kinds of things. Like where, where in our organization should we start in terms of looking if this is right for me? And yeah, Daniel, another really, really good question. So everyone's going to have their own philosophy. So I can only give you Peter's philosophy. I can't, I can't, I can't, there's no necessarily right or wrong answer. 
So I'm I'm not sure that I'd want to go to the one that's going to save me a thousand dollars a year. But one of the things when you do the assessment of what are you going to do is one that has a very high likelihood of success. Because if you go and jump on that big project that's going to save you a million dollars a year, but is only 30% chance of being successful, if you fail, you're never going to use that technology because, oh, we tried it, we invested all this money, and it failed, it doesn't work. And so I believe it's better to do the $1,000 savings than the million dollar savings if that's the only project you have 90% confidence you can make it work. So also assess what's the likelihood of success before you make that choice. And if you don't have a high likelihood of success, don't make that the first one you go after. You'll almost have to get lucky to be successful and then take it to all sorts of other things. We, we did our ERP implementation and I actually had a board member um, when I framed up how we were going to roll it out. I said, we're going to go to the smallest plant first, the one that if everything falls apart, I can build by hand and not shut the business down. And, and one of the board members said, well, you should go to your largest plant because that's the one that really proves everything works. And I just bit my tongue because I'm a little bit more mature than when I was a 20 or something. And I didn't say, are you kidding? Are, you know, in our biggest plant, not only did I want to make sure that it was more proven and that you weren't debugging the system when you did it on your most critical plant and went live, but also by the time I got to my most critical plant, I had expert users throughout the entire company who were all there ready to help on the new implementation. And so by having success in putting it in, you also now have a roadmap as to how you can be successful on the bigger projects. You also have power users who have done this. They can teach each other. They can help. They can be a point of reference. And so I, I, I'm not a believer that you go take off your biggest challenge um, right from the start. Prove it works. Get comfortable. Develop in-house expertise. Get a few power users who really are going to be able to take this technology and make it work and then go from there and build from there. Yeah, I, I think that's great advice because, I, I, you know, a lot of companies just kind of look at it as cost versus reward. Right. And you're kind of adding that extra dimension of, well, probability of success. Right. Because you're not you're not just looking at, hey, this is going to save me a million dollars, 10 million dollars, whatever. It's a matter of to your point of if it's only 30% likely to succeed, then it, it's not about the whether it's saving a thousand dollars or a million dollars, which what is the greatest chance that it's going to lead to something? And then once you say, hey, this led to something, now how do we lead make it lead to something more and more and more and more so that um, you know you get down to that, you know, to your point of getting to that to the the biggest challenge that you have. And now you have a whole team of people that, you know, have the expertise to jump in and, and help. And Daniel, I would say not only that, but your 30% goes up to 70 because you have learned, you've built the muscles in, in, in house, you've, you've made some mistakes, um, that were not critical and you were able to get to where you needed to get to as a result. So your chances of getting that million dollar savings now go up from 30% to 70 or 80 or even 95 because now it's proven, you know how to do it, and you, 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 you didn't bite off more than you could chew on the very first um, bite of the apple, right? So I, I'm a big believer in doing that. Um, I think with technology, there's still a lot out there that is unproven. Um, and again, how many ERP failures have, have happened? And it's going to happen with AI and it's going to happen with automations. You're going to go in and have a lot of companies that try it, think that it's going to be fantastic. They're going to do it not with best practices, but they're going to do it the wrong way. And then they're going to just say, oh, it doesn't work. And if their competitor 
does it the right way. And and it's a it's a journey. It's not an on off switch. I'm going to go into AI and start using it. I'm going to use automations. I'm going to use technology. No, we've got a journey as to how we're going to apply technology, how we're going to leverage it in the right way, and how we're going to have the best outcome that we can over time. Business is not a sprint. Business is a marathon. So we got to also think about pacing ourselves and taking it based on one mile marker at a time in order to get to the finish line with the best time we can. Yeah, no, that that's great. And I, I know we're getting, uh, getting close to, to, to time here, but, uh, you raised a really good point that I just want to jump in quickly on. And, you know, it, it sounds like you, you were thinking about a lot of things that, um, are often overlooked with technology implementations and that's the support that is available after you've implemented the technology and, you know, going that route of starting small, building up, you know, now you're building the, you know, that center of excellence, if you will, in internally in your organization to be able to support the technology versus the people that just jump right in and say, all right, you know, we spent $10 million making sure AI worked. We flipped the switch, it worked. And then a month later, something broke and nobody in, on our team knows how to, uh, you know, go and support this and, and fix it. So, you know, I guess as you're, you know, looking at technologies and, and things to improve the business, um, you know, how much time goes into the, like, you know, who's going to support this? How's this going to be supported? And how do we make sure that the team is trained up on, you know, <laughs> on being able to use this? Hey, I wish I had the perfect answer for you on that, Daniel. Um, so, I, I always use the expression, perfection is the enemy of progress. There is no way you will get it perfect. You have to accept that it will be imperfect, but try to do as much forward thinking as you can to minimize the imperfections. And yeah, as far as you know, putting in an ERP or putting in an AI, um, I also believe you talk to people who've gone before you. And that's one of the reasons with AI, I'm a little bit leery to jump in too fast because I'd rather other people make some mistakes um, that I can be taught and, and learn from. Or guys like you, are, you know, you're on your fifth or sixth implementation rather than, oh, Facebook Milling, you're my first. Right, <laughs> Thanks right. for being my guinea pig, right? Right. Um, it's... The, the challenge is the technology is moving so fast. I don't want to wait too long or I'll be, I'll be way behind. So how do we get to be in the right balance of not being the first adopters, but the early adopters who can already learn from the mistakes and from the lessons that were picked up from the ones that went first? Right. No, that's great. Um, great advice. Um, you know, before we wrap up here, any other um, nuggets of wisdom that you have, uh, you know, maybe something we haven't talked about or maybe, it, you know, piggybacks on something that we did? I, 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 I think we've covered a fair amount of ground as far as technology is concerned. I, I have so much to learn. And you know what? I think it's awesome. After all of my years of experience, the fact that I sit here and I can still learn and still have a desire to learn. So my only, be curious, read, get exposure, talk to other people and get excited. Don't get frightened. Don't be afraid of the future. Embrace it and say, hmm, it's unknown and that's great. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Um, if anyone in the, you know, in our audience wants to get in contact you, what's the best way for them, uh, is it to connect on LinkedIn or do you have other, um, yeah. So, so fortunately I have a name that's a little bit, um, rare. Um, I'm not John Smith, I'm Peter Bonat, uh, and there is not many Peter Bonats on LinkedIn. So I'm, I'm easy to find on LinkedIn. Um, I'm the chief financial officer of Bay State Milling Company. We have, um, a website, BSM for Bay State Milling, bsm.com. Um, I've had a long career. I've worked for some very, very 
um, prestigious, large, well-known companies, and Bay State is the best company I have ever worked for. We're doing some really innovative things in the food space, in the agricultural space, um, making some some innovative new products um, for, for, for consumers that will be healthier for you and great tasting. So we're pretty excited about where we're headed, and we need the technology to back us up as we go into these new areas to be successful. Um, but very much appreciated, Daniel. It's been fun. Yeah, no, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. I feel like we could have talked for another five hours and uh, there would have been a lot more, um, you know, great, uh, great lessons learned uh, from it. I certainly got a lot from this, uh, you know, from this uh, episode here. I know our, our guests will as well. So we appreciate you uh, coming on. You know, again, just want to remind our guests, make sure you like, subs- uh, subscribe to the channel. Uh, for our audience, uh, you know, we want to make sure we get other great guests just like Peter on the show. And, you know, Peter, we'd love to have you on again uh, at some point in the future. I'd be happy to, Daniel. You've been great. Great.